We're going to um, finish looking at that portion of Scripture that we were looking at this morning, which we saw there were basically a couple of things that were woven uh, through this paragraph, a couple of themes. Uh, the first one we looked at this morning, that if we love the Lord, we will obey Him. Uh, this evening we're going to see that if that is true, at least if it was true for the disciples at that time, uh, the Lord promised to give to them another comforter. Now again, there's going to be a bit of a difference here because we're looking at a time frame uh, that takes place before Pentecost. And there were some differences in the work of the Spirit before and after. What Jesus is going to describe for us here is what He was promising His disciples that He would uh, give to them if, in fact, they already loved Him and showed that love through their obedience. So uh, I just want to mention this up front. I think I may have already said this, that um, this section can be very confusing, and it may be open to a variety of interpretations. But I do believe that what Jesus is talking about here is the day of Pentecost, and I do believe when He says that He's going and coming again, that He is referring to His sending the Spirit, when He talks about He's going to dwell in our hearts along with the Father, I do believe He is talking about by the Holy Spirit. So I think everything that He is mentioning in here has to do with the promise of the Spirit, which He was going to pour out on the day of Pentecost. So with that, with that understanding, let's try to understand it as I, as I read it. Uh, perhaps it'll make a little more sense. So beginning in verse 15, Jesus says, "'If you love Me, you will keep My commandments. I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see Him or know Him. But you know Him, because He abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see Me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You heard that I said to you, I go away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now I have told you before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me. But so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up, let us go from here. Now again, may the Lord bless His word to our, our hearing this evening. Now, this text is rather large, but I, I don't think it should take too much longer to get through it than perhaps normally. What I'd like to do is simply explain it first and then make application at the end. Now, again, this morning we saw how we can know that we have truly trusted in the Lord that we've gone beyond simply knowing the facts of the gospel and believing that they're true, but that we actually have closed savingly with Jesus Christ from the heart, that we have trusted Him because we love Him, and the way we can know is through our obedience. 
Now, if there's anything that we've learned from the Reformation, it is that we know that we are, we are not saved by our works, but by faith in Jesus and in His works. You know, we are saved by works, just not our works. We're saved by the works of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're not talking about salvation by works, right? But I hope it's equally clear from what we saw this morning that even though we're not saved by our works, we cannot be saved apart from works because they are the evidence that we really love Jesus. As he told us this morning in verse 15, what I've just read, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, the disciples already loved Jesus, and the disciples had already shown Jesus that love through their obedience. I mean, this is at the end of three and a half years. They've been following him. They've been serving him. And the reason they did was because they loved him, with the exception, of course, of Judas, which means they already had the Spirit with them. They had the influence of the Spirit of God in their lives. But Jesus went on in our text here to talk about a further work of the Spirit that He was about to send. He, that is Jesus, their present comforter, was about to leave, but He was going to send another comforter, another helper, one who would dwell within them and one who would be with them forever. Now, I've already told you he was talking about the promise of his Father that he would pour out on the day of Pentecost. What he is describing, I believe, in our text this evening is the difference that day and that outpouring would make in the lives of his disciples. And, of course, because those differences, for the most part, continue into the present these are things that we too can experience and things that we should be experiencing in our walk with the Lord, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So this evening, what I'd like us to do is consider the blessings the Lord has given to us through the outpouring of His Holy Spirit. Now again, uh, try to stay with me. We're going to look at a few things before we make application, but just realize that for the most part, there are some differences, but for the most part, what Jesus is telling His disciples was going to be true of them is also true of us, again, with a couple of exceptions. Now, first of all, Jesus says the Spirit would take over the ministry that He had been providing to His disciples up to that time, only in this case, the ministry of the Spirit it was something that would never come to an end. Jesus tells us in verse 16, I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper, that He may be with you forever. Now, the word helper here means somebody who would provide protection, somebody who would provide security for them. Up to this point, Jesus had been their guide, Jesus had been their guard, He had been their shield, but the help that He had been giving them in His earthly ministry was coming to an end. He was telling them that He was about to leave and return to heaven, but He would not leave them defenseless. He was going to give them another helper. Now, who was this helper? Jesus says in verse 17 that He is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see Him or know Him, but you know Him because He abides with you and will be in you. Now, Jesus told us earlier in John's Gospel, chapter 14, I believe it was in verse 6, that He is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, if Jesus is the truth, it shouldn't surprise us that His Spirit would be the Spirit of truth because the Spirit, as we know, is the one who in the Old Testament revealed the truth of God. He was the one who, uh, as it were, gave the Word of God through the Old Testament prophets. And He was also the one whom Jesus was giving to His disciples who would lead them into all the truth so that they might be able to complete His Word. Remember, the apostles are the ones through whom were in close associates were the ones who, through whom the Lord gave us His Word. Now, this particular ministry of the Spirit of God that He was promising to provide would be exclusively for them. It would not be for the world. 
Now, Jesus is going to tell us later what it is the Spirit of God actually does in His ministry to the world, which is primarily to convict them of sin, to work through their conscience, to open their eyes, to show them their need of the Lord Jesus Christ. The world could not receive this ministry that Jesus is speaking of here of the Holy Spirit because the world did not see Him and did not know Him, which means they were still in the darkness of sin. They first of all had to be born again of the Holy Spirit. But the disciples knew Him. Jesus says He was already with them. He was at work in their lives. Uh, and there was one, uh, I should say, also who was with them who was just like Him. And that is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus says, you know the Spirit. He's with you. Uh, one might be tempted to think he was referring to himself because here was Jesus anointed with the Spirit of God and who shared the same nature as the Spirit, even as he shares the same nature with the Father, although I think he meant here the Spirit's ministry was already with them. But I just point this out to say something we're going to see a little bit later, that the Spirit shares the same nature with the Father and the Son so that when the Spirit is said to indwell us, Jesus says He indwells us. He also says the Father indwells us. Jesus said earlier, remember, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Because they share that same nature, He could just as easily have said this, He who has seen me has seen the Spirit. Now, they're not all the same person, remember, but they do all have the same character, the same character that they are working in us as their children. Now, the Spirit was already with them. Jesus says they already knew Him, but I want you to notice that Jesus said that He would, after this particular blessing, be in them. Now, I think what He's describing here is the difference in the Spirit's work before and after Pentecost. The Spirit of God was now with them, working His graces in their hearts making them love Jesus and His ways, but then He would be in them, taking up residence in their hearts, making them the living temples of God. Now think about this for a minute because when Jesus completes His ministry and He dies on the cross and yields up His Spirit, what is it that, that actually takes place at that moment? The veil of the temple is torn from the top to the bottom and the, the, uh, basically the, the temple worship becomes obsolete. Well, we know there was a time when God by His Spirit dwelt in temples made with hands, or at least the temple that He had had His people built. But once the temple becomes obsolete, now we see that the temple becomes the people of God. He takes up residence now in temples not made with hands, in those who are living stones, who are all being built together into a spiritual temple of the Lord in order to offer spiritual sacrifices. So basically, we become temples of the Holy Spirit. He begins to live within us. That's what Jesus said was going to happen here. Now, this difference in the Spirit's ministry is usually characterized, if you read uh, biblical commentators, theologians, as more. When you talk about the difference between what the Spirit of God did in the Old Covenant versus what He does in the New Covenant, the word is more. That's the way we describe it. He, he does the same thing, only He does more with more power. Well, what makes it more powerful, obviously, is the fact the Spirit of God takes up residence within the hearts of His people. So Jesus was leaving, <clears throat> but He wasn't going to abandon them. He was going to come to them again in the person of the Spirit. Okay, I want you to notice now in verses 18 through 20. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me and I in you. Now, I think at first blush here, we might be tempted to think that what Jesus was speaking here of was His resurrection. That they would see Him again after His crucifixion. They would see Him again alive from the dead. 
But I think he was more likely speaking about the way that he would now dwell within his people, that they would no longer see him with their physical eyes, at least after he went to heaven, but now they would see him through the eyes of faith. The Spirit of God was going to come, and he was going to reveal to them Jesus. They would see him seated in heaven. They never actually saw that with their physical eyes, at least until... Well, actually, they still haven't with their physical eyes, but they did go to heaven eventually when they died, and they saw Jesus there, but they would know that He is there through the Spirit of God. When the Spirit came, Jesus said that they would know that what He said was true, that He really was in His Father, really in union with His Father, sharing the same nature as His Father, that they would know that they were in union with Him and that He dwelt within them. That's what I think Jesus is referring to here by the phrase, in that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Well, if Jesus was talking about Him standing physically in front of them, they might wonder what that meant. But if He was talking about the Spirit of God coming into their hearts and that He actually did dwell within them, that would make more sense. And of course, if, this, if He dwelt in them by the Spirit, that because He lives, they would live also. Remember, it was the Spirit of God within Christ that raised Him from the dead. And Paul says, if that same Spirit dwells within you, the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. If the Spirit of God lives in you, then not only will you continue to live after you die, except now in heaven as, as a spiritual, uh, well, basically as a spiritual being, whereas your body is returned to the earth. But one day, He is going to raise your body as well and reunite it with your soul. So Jesus said the Spirit of God would protect their souls and their bodies. Now again, getting back to the point we saw this morning, how did they know? How did Jesus say they could know? That they would receive the Spirit, that He would come and remain in them. Jesus said it was because He was already with them. Jesus said that the evidence was their love for Him, which could be seen through their obedience. We read in verses 21 through 23, and again, think of it in this context. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you were going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my words and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with Him. Now, I've seen this passage used before to talk about another experience that we can have uh, through obedience to the Lord, that if we will simply consecrate ourselves and, and devote ourselves entirely to the Lord to do His will, that in a mystical way, Jesus is going to come to us and the Father is going to come to us and we're going to have this new kind of experience. But I do think that what Jesus is referring to here is simply, again, the other helper, the Holy Spirit. When He says, if you keep my commandments, you really love me, that shows you that the Spirit of God dwells with you. And it also shows you that He will eventually be in you, which, of course, is what Jesus here is promising. When Jesus tells His disciples that He and His Father would come and live in them, he was speaking of the Spirit. So this isn't a second experience, but this is something that we should be experiencing as believers uh, right now. Now, the second question is, after having seen this promise that Jesus has made of the fact that He is going to give uh, another helper once He leaves, uh, what is it that the helper was actually going to do? We've already seen that He's going to lead them into all the truth, that He is going to be one who is going to guard them and protect them, but there are other things that He would do as well. Now, the first thing He was going to do was He was going to continue to guide and to teach them in the same way that Jesus had done for them earlier. 
what we should just back up and see is this, that the Spirit of God was going to do for them what Jesus had done for them while He was on earth, okay? Um, first of all, He would help them remember what Jesus had said. We read in verses 25 and 26. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Now, this ministry of the Spirit is what I was referring to a little bit earlier when I mentioned that Jesus calls him the Spirit of truth, the one who led the Old Testament prophets to the truth. He was the one that Jesus was promising to them so that they also would be able to remember what Jesus had said and to be able to record it. This is how those among them who wrote, Paul, who, whom the Lord would call a bit later than this, and their associates, Luke and Mark, who were basically the exceptions, you might say, to the rule, um, and I think James might have been another because I believe it was the brother of the Lord rather than the disciple, uh, who wrote that this is how they would be able to remember and understand what Jesus said and what Jesus did so that they would be able to write the Gospels and the letters to the churches so that God's people, so that we, would have the Lord's instruction for all time. So the Spirit of God, first of all, was going to lead them into truth. He was going to teach them all things and bring to their remembrance all that He had said. That's how we can have the words of Christ recorded for us in Scripture. Secondly, Jesus said He would give them peace. Jesus told them earlier not to be troubled by the fact that He was leaving, by what they were going to have to face now without Him, but rather to believe in Him, to believe in His Father that they would work everything together for their good. Same thing that the, the, you know, Paul promises us in Romans chapter 8, in verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who know the Lord, for those who love Him, to those who are called according to His purpose. Well, Jesus says the Spirit of God is the one who is going to take those promises and actually bring them home to their hearts that they might have peace. Jesus says in verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Now, I do believe that uh, that peace that Jesus is referring to here is the work of the Spirit of God within us giving to us that comfort, that hope that everything is going to work together for good. But I do want you to notice that Jesus says here as well that even though the Spirit of God does that, we do need to yield to the Spirit. We have our part to play. They would have to believe, as we would have to believe, the Spirit's testimony to these truths. And I think Jesus was saying here that once the Spirit of God comes within you and testifies to that truth from within your soul, it's a lot easier to believe it and to apprehend it than it would be if it's just printed on a page. Now that, again, is the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, you know that God gave His people the Word externally. He took His law and He wrote it on tablets of stone. In the New Covenant, He writes them upon our hearts. And I think he internalizes also by the Spirit of God the promises of God so that we might have peace. Now, thirdly, because he was sending them the Spirit who was going to bring down these blessings, it would also give them a reason to rejoice. Now, clearly, Jesus said he was going to the Father, but he also said he was coming to them again in the person of the Spirit as He poured the Spirit out from heaven. And of course, that brought with it certain blessings over which they could rejoice. He tells us in Luke 24, verse 49, And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Now again, this power, this, this blessing of power was a cause for rejoicing because with it, 
they would actually be able to carry on His work. Jesus says in verse 28 of John 14, You heard that I said to you, I go away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. You see, the fact is Jesus was going, but He was coming. But He was coming in the presence of His Holy Spirit, and with the Spirit there would be power. So that was something that the disciples could rejoice in. By the way, uh, again, I realize I'm covering a lot of ground, so I'm going to come back at the end and and bring this all home. Uh, But let me just mention here in passing, when Jesus says the Father is greater than I, we do need to be careful not to be tempted here to think that Jesus is in any way less than the Father. I do believe when Jesus says this, He is talking from His human nature as the man, Christ Jesus, about His Father's divine nature, or He is speaking in His role of a servant. Remember, in the plan of redemption, the Son willingly submits Himself to the Father in order to become a servant to the Father in bringing His people savingly back to Him. This does not mean that Jesus in His divine nature is any less than God. We do believe the persons of the Godhead are equal in power and authority, in majesty and in glory. Now finally, all of this would serve to strengthen their faith. Jesus concludes by saying something He said a little bit earlier in verse 29, Now I have told you before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. Well, again, he told them that he was going to be betrayed and and he was having to go so that he might glorify his father. And I've told you that I'm going to be betrayed and, and all these things so that when it happens, you will believe. Now, Jesus says, I'm telling you here about this blessing of the Holy Spirit, this power that I'm going to pour out from heaven so that when it happens, you may believe. Jesus wanted to comfort them, but he also wanted to confirm them, to confirm them in who He is. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. To confirm them in what He had told them to do so that they might follow Him. Being the Messiah, we need to listen. We need to do what He says. The Spirit of God is coming. When He comes, we will know that He is the Messiah. We will know He comes from God. We will then do what He told us to do. And Jesus wanted to confirm them in the success that He promised that as they go out to do His will, He would be with them and they would be able to accomplish His will so that that would encourage them to move forward. Now, Jesus finishes by telling them in verses 30 and 31, I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of the world is coming and He has nothing in me, but so that the world may know that I love the Father I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up. Let us go from here. Jesus is simply saying His time with them was now limited. There were, there were other things that He needed to teach them, but He wouldn't have time to do, but He would do later when the Spirit came. Remember, when the Spirit comes, He's going to teach them, um, teach them things that Jesus had not yet taught them and bring to their remembrance what He had taught them. They would have to wait for the ministry of the Spirit for that to happen. Jesus said the ruler ruler of the world was coming. That is the devil, the one who usurped the world from Adam, the one who was conspiring now to put Jesus to death. He was going to come and accuse Jesus even though there were no grounds upon which Satan could accuse him. He would find nothing in him. Jesus, though, would have to face him and his accusations. He would go, well, he would be condemned. He would go to the cross in order that he might carry out what his father sent him to do. And Jesus was going to do it because he loved him. Remember, we saw this morning that um, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He says, I love my father. And I have kept his commandments. That's how the world knows that I love the father, is that I, I obey him. Jesus here is saying that He was willing and ready to obey the Father and to carry out His plan because He loves Him. And again, that is an encouragement to us to do the same thing with regard to our Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus tells His disciples that they should get up 
and get moving as well. The interesting thing here is they don't actually move from where they are after he says that. They're still in the same, the same room. Uh, they didn't leave to go yet to the garden. I don't think these words are superfluous. I think what Jesus is saying, this is what I am ready to do, and you need to be ready to do it as well. So now we've looked at a lot of things. Let me just simply bring all of this back to how it bears upon us. Now, I did mention that uh, there are some things that apply and there are some things that don't apply. So what are the things that apply? Well, you know, we know, of course, Jesus is not with us today as He was with His disciples nearly 2,000 years ago. He is not here physically. And yet, He is here with us as He was with them after He ascended into heaven. He is with us by the presence of His Holy Spirit. In other words, we do have the same thing they had after Jesus ascended into heaven. We have a helper. We have a protector. We have someone who is just like Jesus. Somebody who shares the same nature that Jesus has, the same nature as the Father. One who cares for us the way the Father loved us in eternity, sent His Son for us, the way the Son loves us and gave His life for us. The Spirit is actually, uh, well, in certain terms, He is that love itself. But He shares that same love with the Father and the Son, and He cares for us. He lives in our souls, just as He lived in theirs, and He will be with us forever. So basically, again, applying it the way Jesus is applying it here, if you have trusted Jesus... And if you have trusted Him because you love Him, and if your love is a genuine love, which is shown, as Jesus told us this morning, by your obedience to Him, He is there in your soul. Okay? He is the reason you trusted Jesus in the first place. He is the reason you love Jesus. He is the reason that you obey Him. Now, if the Spirit of God is in your soul, then basically you have a situation, we all have a situation if we're trusting Jesus, that is very much like the one that the disciples have. You have one who teaches you. You have one who guides you, just as Jesus did His disciples. Now, the difference is the Spirit of God does not reveal new truths to you as He did to them. But I do believe that He does bring to your mind the things that Jesus said and did which are recorded in the Word of God. In other words, the Spirit of God brings to your mind what Jesus said. He doesn't give you infallible recall the way that He gave to His disciples, but He does <clears throat> help you remember and He helps you understand the truth that He has already given to you in the Word of God. By the way, we call that the illumination of the Spirit of God. We call that the unction of the Spirit of God. It is that work that the Spirit does that focuses our attention on the Word of God, that causes us to love what we see, that allows us to see the glory of Jesus Christ in what we see, so that when we look at the pages of Scripture, we know this isn't just the Word of man, that this is the Word of God. And that helps us do what it is the Lord wants us to do. It helps us to receive what the Lord has promised us in the Word because we see that it is different. We see that it is from God. That's what the Spirit of God does. He shows us the truth of God. He teaches us and guides us by showing us that this is the way that we should walk in. If the Spirit of God is in your soul, if you're trusting Him, if you're loving Him and obeying Him and He's there, then He is also the one who grants peace to you in knowing that these promises that Jesus has made actually apply to you. It's one thing to have a promise and to say, well, He promises this to His people. But it's another thing to know that that promise actually applies to you, that everything that happens to you is going to work together for your good eventually. Remember, uh, it wasn't too long ago we saw, I think it was Jeff Thomas, talking about how Jesus had joy in everything that he went through because he knew everything that was happening to him, every situation he was in, 
everything he had to face was a part of his father's plan. And knowing that it was a part of his father's plan for his good and that he was going to work it together for his good, Jesus could rejoice in it. Well, the same thing is true of you and me if we love the Lord and are trusting him and are serving him. Everything that happens to us is a part of his will. And he's promised that he's going to work it all together for good, which means we can rejoice in those circumstances and it means we can have peace. Peace not only knowing that it is going to work out together for good, but also peace in knowing that we are the Lord's because the Spirit of God also confirms to us that we actually do belong to Him. He is the Spirit of adoption by which we cry out to the Lord, Father, and know that He really is our Father. Now, that assurance that the Spirit of God gives may be stronger and it may be weaker but it's always there, and it always brings peace. My peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. And that peace the Lord gives to us helps us to be able to endure whatever it is we have to face in this life, those most difficult times. It's what keeps us from utterly crumbling. We don't despair like those who have no hope. We do have a hope, and it shores us up. It's the peace of God. If the Spirit is present in your soul, then that, you basically have that power that the Lord promised to His people. That's what we've continually, of course, are praying that God would give to us, the power to serve Him, the power to be His witnesses, the power to use the gifts that He has given to us so that we might be fruitful in the Lord's service. If the Spirit of God is in you, you also have that power. You just simply need to pray and believe, and the Spirit of God will allow you to exercise that power. Now, again, it's going to be greater or less depending upon God's will. We're not all going to be able to do what Peter did. We're not all going to be able to do what Paul did. We're not all going to be able to do what Whitfield did. But we're going to be able to do a lot more than we could without the Spirit of God by His work within us. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. But through me, you can do all things. And that power that he's talking about there is the power of the Holy Spirit. He has given you that power. Don't try to serve him. Don't try to minister in his name without that power because you'll, you'll flounder. But with the Spirit of God, you can be very effective. That's why, this, why Jesus gave him to us, so that we might love him, trust him, and that we might do things, great things in his name. And if he's there, as I've already mentioned, he will continually confirm his promises to you in such a way that he will give you the courage to move forward, even as Jesus said to his disciples at the end of the section, get up, let us go from here. Jesus was saying more than let's just move from this room into the garden or let's move from this room to the next room. But I believe he was saying, you know, that the Spirit of God is, is giving you, he will give you that power to be able to, uh, to move forward in this world with this work. He'll give you the courage that you need to move forward even though you will face a great deal of opposition. So basically the point is this, that Jesus is in heaven. I mean, he said, I'm leaving, I'm going to the Father. But he is very much present still on earth. He is with us. He is in our souls to help us serve Him, to help us honor Him. And of course, that should give us every reason to be confident, to be hopeful, and to rejoice in every circumstance. May the Lord grant to us uh, that we might. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to help us uh, appropriate the things that we've just seen.